Criminal Minds, TV versus reality. Something's overriding our commands. Coming up. Hey, 74 crew, welcome back. If you don't know me, my name's Kelsey. I'm a 747 pilot. My channel, 74 Gear, is all about aviation. Something I'm often asked can a plane be hacked from the ground by a bad guy? And strangely enough, I had someone send me this episode of Criminal Minds where that's exactly what happened. So let's see how real it is. Let's get into it. Let me fill you in on the latest. Transalliance Flight 420, originating from Pittsburgh International at 1300 Zulu, scheduled to arrive at Phoenix Sky Harbor at 1710. The first call received about a downed aircraft was at 1608. The scheduled flight path doesn't cross over this part of Colorado. No, the plane was off course by 150 miles. Did the pilots know that? It's unclear. Regional air traffic controllers lost communication with the plane 13 minutes before the crash. They could have covered that distance during that time. Any sign of mechanical trouble? Unclear again. Uh, 10 minutes after they lost communication, the ACARS data reporting system shut down or was turned off. Either I'm getting more critical of these videos that you're sending me or they're getting more ridiculous and that's coming from a guy who did a Hollywood versus reality on Madagascar 2, but Let's talk about this first scene here. Most people who are scared to fly, the biggest problem that they have is turbulence. But the risks of having an accident from turbulence is very, very small. And the reason I say small risk is because there are no absolutes in this world. You could be sitting in your house right now and have a plane part come crashing through your roof. Anything could happen anywhere. So the same is for flying through turbulence. Anything could happen, but these planes are built to withstand turbulence that most of you have never experienced before. Let's talk about these O2 masks coming down here. There are a few circumstances with your O2 masks of when they're gonna come down. One is the pilots accidentally or purposely hit the button to release them. We call it releasing the rubber jungle. It's not something that you wanna do. Don't be that guy who accidentally hits that button because maintenance then has to come on board and put them all back and, and you don't wanna be that guy, trust me. I've never done it, but I've seen it happen. The most common way that the mask actually deploy though is when the cabin altitude gets to a certain level. So let's just use rough numbers. Typically, when you're flying in a plane, the altitude of the cabin that you're in is somewhere between five and 8,000 feet, which means your body feels like it's at five or 8,000 feet, which is totally fine. There are a lot of cities. 5,000 feet is Denver. You have some cities in South America that are at 8,000 feet. Your body's fine at that and you're not doing any exercise, so you're fine at that altitude. But what will happen is let's say at 10 or 12 or 14, I think it depends on the plane, at that altitude, when the cabin feels like it's at 10,000 feet, those masks will drop. So with those masks dropping, it's just an automatic. The pilots aren't involved in it in any way. So when you see things like a, an explosion on the side of a plane and then all the mask drops, that's the reason. It's because the altitude of the plane, now in the cabin there where you're at, went to that altitude of outside. So it now says, hey, we're at 30,000 feet. So 10,000 or above, we're gonna drop those masks. That's how that typically works. I have never seen all the masks deploy from turbulence. So I'll tell you a quick story. I was coming out of Newark once. I was in a regional jet, small regional jet years ago, and I was coming out and we hit some turbulence that was caused from another aircraft. When we hit that, it was very, very aggressive. It was one of the most aggressive wake turbulence that I've ever experienced. And I think what we hit was something like a Boeing 777, which is a big wide body aircraft. And we were in a much smaller aircraft. So as you can imagine, it's more aggressive as your aircraft gets smaller. Well, we hit that and it was so aggressive that some of the ceiling panels in the plane actually fell down. Now, in a lot of planes, those ceiling panels that are up there are actually have wires to keep them from falling down on people, which at the time I didn't know that, but it was so aggressive that a bunch of panels came down. Luckily, we were only maybe at four or 5,000 feet. As soon as we got through 10,000 feet, I called one of the flight attendants and said, hey, are you guys okay? And she said, yeah, we're fine. And I said, what about the other person back there? And they said, yeah, yeah everybody's fine back here. Passengers are fine, no big deal, but there are some panels that are down. I said, okay, no problem. So we got up into cruise. When we got up into cruise, I actually went back there to make sure that there was nothing wrong or nothing dangerous or anything like that that had happened. 
but none of the oxygen masks grow out. That doesn't mean that they can't come out from turbulence, but it's very, very rare. So this whole thing with masks coming out from turbulence, that's super Hollywood. Something else I want to point out is this map here. Even though we try to fly direct as possible when we're flying, the routes that we take, the roads in the sky, if you will, they look nothing like this. It's not just a direct line, even though we try to make it as direct as possible on shorter flights. There is no direct line like this when we're flying. Next, he mentions the A cars. Any sign of mechanical trouble? Unclear again. Uh, 10 minutes after they lost communication, the A cars data reporting system shut down or was turned off. I've noticed over the years that Hollywood will get an idea or a name of something like, for a while, it seemed like every video or movie had planes dumping fuel. I don't know why they get this idea and they just all keep making videos about it. And this is the same thing with the ACARS. They were talking about the ACARS system. ACARS, what it stands for is Aircraft Communications and Reporting System. Think of that system as our way to text message with our company or people anywhere in the world. Unfortunately, there's no pictures or anything cool. It's just basically to send messages. And you just basically type in the message that you want to send here and it sends it out. That's the ACAR system. But here's a picture of the manuals on a 747 that shows there's one ACAR system and there's zero that are required. That's the zero here. It means that you need zero to actually operate that flight. What that manual shows is it's all the things that are installed on the aircraft and then what you have to have. So this saying it's zero means it's not something that you have to have when you go fly. Now I've flown without an ACAR system. It's annoying, but you can do it. Obviously it says zero, it's not required equipment. So then making a big deal about the loss of a car system is also very Hollywood. Agent Reed said passengers vomited before the crash, which would confirm the severe turbulence the co-pilot described. Well, a specific type of movement, porpoising, tends to cause vomiting. Porpoising isn't going up and down on a wave or like a roller coaster? Yes, as opposed to side to side movement. And what would cause porpoising? Being caught in the jet stream of another plane, but there was no other flight nearby. Is there something else, something mechanical perhaps? A deployment of the slats midair? You mean the flaps? Uh, the flaps are on the back of the wing. The slats are similar, but they're on the leading edge. They're used during takeoff. It's very rare that they would deploy mid-flight. There's lots of safeguards against it. I mentioned earlier about hitting wake turbulence. It's a turbulence that's created by another aircraft. The best way I can describe it to you is if you're driving your car and you went over a speed bump at like 60 miles an hour. It's over really quick, but it's very aggressive. You notice it. And that's how you know it's wake turbulence instead of something else. If it were something like normal turbulence, it's going to go on and on and on, or it's going to have a different movement to it. But when it's wake turbulence and you're going, let's say 90 degrees over it, it's going to be aggressive, like driving over a speed bump. The other way you can experience wake turbulence is if you were to fly directly behind another aircraft. Now I've had it where I was flying directly behind another aircraft and what happened is it made one wing go down and one wing go up. To the passengers what that feels like is the plane is banking, but in reality we weren't. We were just right behind another plane and it was pushing our left wing down and then our right wing was going up because there was no wake turbulence that was pushing on that wing. So in that scenario, it's a different feeling. It, passengers wouldn't even know that that was happening, but me as a pilot, since it was up there and I knew we weren't supposed to be turning, I said, well, this isn't right. And that was wake turbulence. So those are the two different types of wake turbulence that you experience as a passenger or as a pilot when you're up, when you're flying. And what would cause porpoising? Being caught in the jet stream of another plane, but there was no other flight nearby. I'm not 100% sure what he's referring to, but I'm guessing he's meaning wake turbulence, but that's the wrong word for it. The only time you have a jet stream from a plane would be when you're on the ground, if they're running the power up and you were to go right behind them. That's the only time you would notice that. Up in the sky, the jet propulsion that's created, unless you're right behind that plane, you wouldn't notice it and nobody's flying that close that you would notice it. I think he means wake turbulence, but again, it would be either very aggressive and be over momentarily, or you might have something that's more of a, a banking angle, but it wouldn't be so aggressive to create turbulence like what they're saying here. So Hollywood either got the word wrong that they were wanting to use or the description wrong because neither of those fit. They're talking about porpoising. The only time that you'll really experience porpoising as a passenger is if you were to get into a plane with a student pilot when they're trying to figure out how to land. That's most of the time that you'll see porpoising. Porpoising is when you've seen a plane going up and down as it's trying to land. And th this is kind of what it looks like here. That porpoising is because the pilot is trying to figure out how to land the plane and they haven't quite figured out everything. And I've been trying to give pointers to Hollywood here so that way if they want to create something and they watch this video, they know what to do. If you're trying to create a situation where the plane was going up and down rapidly, what you could have said is the elevator was jammed and the pilots were trying to regain control by adding and reducing the power quickly and trying to unjam the elevator. That would make a lot more sense or the pilots were trying to control the pitch of the aircraft 
by just using power. That would make sense as well. But the whole thing that you're explaining with porpoising and jet stream, which is the wrong word, none of that makes sense. That's 100% Hollywood. Next he says deploying the slants mid-flight could cause porpoising. Is there something else, something mechanical perhaps? A deployment of the slats mid-air? That's also very Hollywood. By deploying the slats or flaps, it's different on different planes, by deploying those, all it's doing is changing the shape of the wing. We use those so the plane can fly slower. So you'll use them for landing, so your landing speed is a lot slower, and you use them for takeoff, so the runway isn't seven miles long when you're taking off, unless you're in Fast and Furious, which then the runways are like, I don't know, 30 miles long. But you use those slats or flaps to help the wing create lift at a much slower speed. It changes the shape of the wing. So by deploying those in flight, which is what you do every time your plane lands, that's how that happens. So when he says this, you mean the flaps? Uh, the flaps are on the back of the wing. The slats are similar, but they're on the leading edge. They're used during takeoff. It's very rare that they would deploy mid-flight. There's lots of safeguards against it. That absolutely makes no sense at all, because otherwise you would have no way to deploy your flaps when you're landing, and you'd be landing with no flaps. And a no-flap landing is an emergency that we train for, but not anything you want to do. If you do that on a 747, you could be landing at 200 knots, something like that, and you're gonna more likely than not blow out your tires. If you want to talk about something that doesn't work mid-flight, try the doors of the aircraft. The plane's pressurized from the inside, the doors of the aircraft won't open mid-flight. This is getting long, and we haven't even gotten to the crash yet. I hope this doesn't keep going downhill. What's Spence doing? Guys, these are the construction blueprints for the airplane. I compared it to the way the plane broke apart, and I think I may have found something interesting. The whole of an airplane is really just a bunch of round barrels riveted together. The wing, however, is a masterpiece. It's the most physically complicated component of an airplane. Nearly 200 feet long, it bears the weight of the entire aircraft and is shaped precisely to fit within a hundredth of an inch. The curvature of the wing is what gives it its lift. Air rushes faster over the top, creating a vacuum, which sucks the wing upward and in turn the entire fuselage. This is important because an airplane wants to be nose up. It creates positive Gs, that sensation you get when you're forced into the back of your seat. Negative Gs, on the other hand, are an entirely different matter. When the nose of a plane begins pitching downward, you get negative Gs, which puts, puts enormous pressure on the structural integrity of the aircraft. Now, I've never claimed to be a really smart boy, but you can't take the blueprints of a 727, which is what they're using here, and then compare it to the breakup of a 747, which is what he's describing in his description of the aircraft. You can't take those two and combine them together to break up the plane unless there's something I don't know. Hollywood has all kinds of things combined here. They got the blueprints of a 727, which most of you will never ever fly on anymore. He's on the inside of a narrow body aircraft. He's giving a description of a 747, which is what I fly as far as for the wing measurements and stuff like that. He's got all these things combined. I mean, truthfully, Hollywood, all you could do is offer some free food and you would get a bunch of retired airline pilots down there. We love free food. Put out a big old breakfast buffet. We'd be down there. You could ask us all kinds of questions. I'm telling you, uh, free food and we're there. I did like the way that he explained the wing design. It is a masterpiece, especially if you look at something like the 787. I don't know who designed those wings. I picked them up. They're, they're made actually in Japan. I picked them up. They are beautiful, especially when you see that plane flying. A 787 wing it is gorgeous. That is a masterpiece. I'm not going to lie. I wouldn't say it's the most complicated thing on the aircraft though. I think the engines, which also on 787 are gorgeous, those are definitely more complicated more complex than the wing is. So saying the wing is the most complex thing, I think is a bit of a reach, but it, it is a masterpiece, that is true. Next he mentions that the nose of an aircraft likes to be up, and that is true. The nose of an aircraft typically is up on a 747, two to three degrees. When we're in cruise, that's about how far it sits up in the air. Now, ideally you wanna be at about two and a half degrees, that's kind of the sweet spot on the 747. So it is true that the nose of the aircraft does like to be up, not up a lot, Two and a half degrees, you're not really gonna notice it. But then he says this about negative Gs when the nose goes over. When the nose of a plane begins pitching downward, you get negative Gs, which puts, puts enormous pressure on the structural integrity of the aircraft. And that is not true. When the nose of an aircraft goes over, unless you push it over really aggressively, that's the only time you're gonna create negative Gs. Negative Gs is like weight loss. So unless you've been flying and experienced negative Gs because the pilot knows the aircraft over so aggressively, then that's not true. You can nose the aircraft over and go downhill or, or descend 
we call it going downhill, or I call it going downhill. You can nose over the aircraft and go downhill or go down, descend. You can do that and not have negative Gs. You could get negative Gs if you were climbing up and then all of a sudden you push the nose over aggressively, which means your momentum is going up and then you push it over, then people are gonna start floating in the air. That's how you get negative Gs when you're flying, not by pushing the nose over to descend. Sometimes you will see guys when they're going through flight school doing negative Gs and they're playing with water bottles in the air and things like that, which I don't recommend doing. There have been situations where people do that and these wings on the aircraft that they're learning in are gravity fed, meaning they need the gravity of the fuel to feed the engine. So then when you negative G your aircraft, all that fuel isn't gravity fed anymore. Now it's floating up in the air. And what can happen is the engine starts puttering because it's not getting any gas. Don't ask me how I know. I, of course, would never do anything like that. So other than the brief explanation of how the wing works, pretty much everything else that they talked about here was 100% Hollywood. The reality is there are at least 50 reasons for lost communication. Such as? Stuck mic, an air traffic controller sending the wrong frequency to an aircraft. The average amount of time for lost communication is seven and a half minutes. We have to remember the transponder was still working. No secret code to indicate a hijacking or any other emergency was sent. Well, let's think about this. The ACARS data recording system was turned off. And that would have to come from someone in control of the flight systems. So, something happened in the cockpit that makes the pilot and or the co-pilot the most likely candidates. You mentioned a slats deployment mid-air. You said it was very rare, but if it did happen, how would it happen? Pilot error or intention. 50 reasons for lost communication? The reality is there are at least 50 reasons for lost communication. I'll challenge anyone to leave something in the comment section that has 10 different forms or reasons for lost communication. I'd be excited to see someone get to 10. So 50, uh, no way. Also, they're calling it ACAR's data recording system now, which is not what it is. Like I said earlier, I think they get an idea of something and then they just kind of go off on a tangent. This whole thing, they seem to be really stuck on the ACARs. They haven't mentioned dumping fuel yet. Maybe that's later on in the video. Back to the topic of the lost communications. That is an issue. The, there's a few things that happen. One, he said stuck mic. Now that's true. You can have it where you accidentally have a mic, which is a button that you push, gets stuck. I mean, it's like anything. You push the button too much and then the gunk gets in there and it gets stuck. On a lot of planes, if you hold the button for too long, it's different for every plane, but you hold the button for too long, a, a message will show up saying stuck mic. It happens. There's also something where you have a frequency that we monitor. I've talked about it a lot. We call it guard. It's one to one decimal five and you're listening to that, or most airline pilots listen to the main frequency where everybody's talking, and then that frequency. And that frequency, what I do is I have it tuned down or turned down very low so I can tell what frequency I'm listening to. The main frequency is a certain volume and that guard is a different volume, so I know when I'm hearing from two different frequencies. That was a trick that I learned when I was a new pilot at the regionals. The captain, I said, how do you know who's talking on what? He goes, turn this one up to this volume, turn this one to this volume, and then when you hear the volume, you'll know who's talking. That was kind of a cool little trick that I learned when I was new. Anyway, so on that frequency, if you have a stuck mic and you're talking, and you shouldn't be, which has happened to pilots when we're doing a public announcement, which is, we call it a PA. When you're talking to the passengers, sometimes it might get stuck, or you're talking on the radio, sometimes it might get stuck. People have done it, it's embarrassing because then you're talking about all these things that you shouldn't be talking about, and that is getting transmitted to everybody in the plane or everybody outside. People will transmit on that frequency guard and say, hey, someone has a stuck mic on this frequency. So when you hear that, then you look down to see if it's you guys in the plane that have the stuck mic or not. That's how that usually gets resolved. The wrong frequency does happen, so sometimes when you're exiting a zone where one air traffic controller is passing you to a different zone, sometimes what you'll have it is that they give you the wrong frequency or you hear the wrong frequency. So they'll say one, two, three, decimal five, and you might hear one, two, five, decimal five. You put that frequency in, you call once or twice, you don't get anybody over there, and then you're out of range from the person who gave you that frequency. So now what do you do? A lot of times what you can do is just listen to guard or transmit on guard and say, hey, I lost the frequency, I'm over here, can somebody give it to me? Or the controller in the new section will transmit on guard to you and say, uh, flight Boeing 123, come up and reach me on this frequency, 123 decimal five. You'll type in that frequency, you'll call them up there, no problem. Now they bring up the slat deployment again. Like I said, they have to be able to deploy in flight. Otherwise it'd be very, very difficult for you to land. Here's a picture of what the slats look like. So you can see that it would be very hard for it to accidentally happen. 
And there is an altitude of which they are prevented from taking them out. So for example, you might say 15,000 feet is the highest that you're allowed to deploy your slats. For example, every plane is different on what altitude you can do what in. So there will be an altitude and pilots wouldn't deploy your flaps or your slats at a higher altitude than that because you're at risk of damaging your aircraft. And if you do that, especially on a commercial plane, your plane will knock you out to your boss or to your management and they'll know and when you land, then you'll get a phone call from the chief pilot. Nobody wants that. And the old rule, snitches get stitches, apparently doesn't apply to these airplanes because they will snitch you out, but they will not snitch themselves out. What I mean by that is, you might have a speed restriction on the plane where you can't go above this speed. If the autopilot is engaged, this is a, a trick here. If the autopilot is engaged, and let's say you're in turbulence, you might exceed the speed limit of what you're supposed to be flying. If the autopilot is on, it won't send a report saying, hey, I went too fast. But if the autopilot is not on, it will send the report saying, hey, they, these pilots went too fast. So the plane will snitch on you, but it will never snitch on itself. Shady, right? Hey, just found the black box. What did you do to the autopilot? Nothing. He must have hit it. It's off now. No. I can't set a new altitude. Are you messing with me? Calm down. Don't tell me to calm down. What the hell? Why did you deploy the slats? It just happened. What are you doing with the yoke? Just stop it. I'm trying to keep her steady. OK, this is ridiculous. Something's buggy in the system. Let's reset it all. Shut everything down. So they shut down eight cars just to reset the flight system. Sounds like there was a catastrophic system failure. So that's what the argument was about. So, all right, so in real life, if the autopilot disengages, it does make a noise, that is true. And in real life, if the autopilot disengaged in a time in flight where nobody wanted it to disengage, instead of pilots blaming each other like they're doing here, what would happen in real life is two people or whoever was on the flight deck would start working to resolve this problem. I actually had something like this happen two weeks ago, three weeks ago, something like that. We were at, I don't know, 34, 35,000 feet, and the autopilot disengaged, which was really, really weird. This plane had a bunch of things. They were about to park this plane in the desert. Anyways, the pilot, autopilot disengaged, and it, what happened is all three of us who were sitting up there immediately started looking at how to resolve the problem. Uh, how we resolve the problem is never going to be uh, shut the entire system down. That's not how it works. We look at a book like this, it's called a QRH. We look at a book like this and it will tell us all the different things that we need to do in order to resolve that problem. So with that book, we go over and it tells us exactly the steps we need to take in order to resolve the situation of the autopilot, for example, turning off. Now in that scenario, we have three different autopilots on the 747. So what we ended up doing is engaging a different autopilot. We wrote it up and the maintenance guys probably fixed it. I don't know. That plane, I think it has two more weeks and then it's gonna, like I said, get parked in the desert, which means it's flying career is over. After a certain number of flight landings or hours, or there's a bunch of different parameters where a plane reaches that lifespan, then it gets parked in the desert and it's done flying. So that plane has reached the end and I think it's just, it's tired. Right, this plane is just tired, so things are just starting to, to go wrong. But we have three different autopilots, and that's one of the reasons. You have the backup, you backup, and your backup. So you've got a bunch of different uh, alternatives if one goes wrong. I think it goes without saying, though, that our planes do not make a cash register noise as we push buttons. I'm not sure why Hollywood wants to make our plane make this noise. No. no but that's not how it works in real life. So since they're talking about this crash happening on a 747, or I, I think it is, they keep jumping around from different aircraft, but since I think it's on a 747, I showed you a picture earlier of what the flap deployment system looks like. That little lever there is how we move the flaps out while we're in flight or on the ground, whatever the situation is, we move that. So if you were flying up there, it would be very hard for that person to move that. It makes a noise because there's metal clunking around. It makes a noise and you would see the person's hand over there moving it. So you wouldn't have one pilot accusing the other pilot of moving it and you not knowing that they moved it, if you get what I'm saying. You would see their hand over there and you would hear them moving it. So the whole thing about him blaming the other guy, like, why are you doing that? That would never happen. You wouldn't have a pilot do that in real life. And then you also, if they did do that, you'd be very clear to see that that's exactly what was happening. So that's also very Hollywood. I can't stress this enough. This ACAR system is not important. So when they're talking about shutting down the system to protect the ACARs or reboot the ACAR system. 
So they shut down eight cars just to reset the flight system. That is literally the last thing on my mind when flaps would be deployed or the autopilot is going. The A cars is so unimportant to what I'm trying to do. The priority is fly the aircraft. So if the autopilot is doing something that I don't want it to do, then I would be focused on that. I wouldn't care about the A cars, especially at that phase of flight. Right there, you just want to fly the aircraft. This video is getting so much longer than I thought it was going to be. I've never had to do a part two for a Hollywood versus reality or TV versus reality. If you see the part two right here, that's part two to this video. If you don't see that there and you want to see some pilots actually arguing with air traffic control in real life, check out this video up here. I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, keep the blue side up.